good morning, everybody. Uh, as Caitlin said, I'm Francine Bennett, and I'm from Mastodon-Sea. So I wanted to talk to you today about uh, data nerding in public health, because really I'm a data nerd, and I'm very excited about the potential of, uh, particularly in the health field, for us to use our skills to have a good impact. So I want to just uh, show you some examples of why I think that's exciting today, and try and make a case for you to take a look at it yourselves. And uh, I work for Mastodon C. Uh, what we do for a living is we build and run uh, systems which make sense of very big or very messy data sets. And uh, we do that using open source technology like Hadoop and Cassandra and using uh, cloud-based servers. So we use all these technologies we were talking about before. Um, but I'm not really here to talk about that in general, um, although we are very excited about uh, working in fields that make a difference. So we think things like government, health, and sustainability are important, and we want to work with them. Um, I'm talking about health in particular because I think it's a very accessible area to work in. Uh, there's amazing data available, and it can have a really big, big impact. But still, you know, why should you care? Well, the answer is probably quite obvious, but uh, just to rub it in a bit further, um, we are at a big data conference by O'Reilly, um, owned by Tim O'Reilly, who famously said that you should build stuff that matters. And really, I, I think working in this uh, health area is, is a fantastic example of building stuff that matters. So we people in this room are, are in a really privileged position right now, um, where a few years ago, the things we were interested in, the things we did, were, were kind of niche, you know, working with open source, working with data. It was seen as kind of geeky, maybe not a sort of C-suite kind of a thing to do. Whereas suddenly now, things are, are changing. You know, big data is seen as really, really important. Um, recruiters are phoning us up the whole time, desperate for us to work on some, some dreadful piece of work. And people in suits are asking for our opinions, and that's a really big change. I, I know I'm kind of in a suit today, but that's because, you know, this is a big room and you all look kind of scary, so you know, I've got to have a bit of defensive armor to, to get through this. So, you know, it's not, I'm not really a suit wearer, but the suit, people in suits, the people with power and money, want to know what we have to say. So it's, it's a fantastic moment of influence for people like us to really try and make a difference. And why else? Well, the NHS um, health service in this country is the fifth biggest organization in the world. It's fifth after the US Army, the Chinese Army, Walmart, and McDonald's. Now, I don't know about you, but I, out of that list of five, I think number five is the one I want to be making the best use of data. So I really, really want people outside the NHS and inside the NHS to be making fantastic use of the data they've got and really running things very efficiently and having bigger impact, getting closer to their goals than any of these other four guys. That's really what I want to see. And they release fantastic amounts of data. And this, this is really cool, actually. Even if you don't care anything about health and you just want some big data to play with, um, they release every prescription item made by every GP in the country, which is 400 million rows of data. That's actually quite a lot to play with. You can, you can think of a few things to do with it. And actually, we first used health data in our company because uh, we were stress testing a Hadoop cluster, and we just wanted to do some big data sets to hit it with. So we actually got into this originally just playing with it because it was a big source of real messy data to play with. They also release data about every doctor, doctor's surgery in the country. There's another 21 million data points about where are doctor's surgeries, uh, how big are they, uh, how do they perform, how old are the people, what gender are they, all, all this other stuff. So it's fantastically rich data. And you, you can look at health using other data sources, like, you know, favorite source for, for playing with real data is Twitter. You, you can kind of use this to analyze things, um, but you don't get that far. So here I did a quick analysis of how many people mention that they're drunk on Twitter, um, how many people mention that they got flu on Twitter. You can, you can see a couple of things. So you can see on Saturday night, people are most likely to be drunk. Not that much of a surprise. You can see that people with flu wake up in the morning and feel crappy, so there's a peak of complaints in the morning. Any, anyway, you know, not that surprising or useful. And when you look at the content of the tweets, you think, well, this isn't going to tell me an awful lot about, you know, what's going on. And really, there's this much more interesting real data of the people who aren't on Twitter, but of everybody in the country's health data. And by the way, this isn't personal data. I think that's an important distinction to make. The data that's released is not about individuals, it's the, uh, the data about doctors and about the whole system. So there's very rich raw data without actually hitting any personal data. 
And I want to show you uh, a couple of things that we've done with that data, which I think are really interesting. So this is an example from some work we did for Nesta, which is the UK innovation agency. And for Nesta, um, something that they are very bothered by is the slow pace of spread of good things in the NHS. So they want to understand why it is that the NHS is fantastic at inventing new things, but weirdly slow at getting those things adopted more widely. So it's that kind of classic saying, the future is already here, but it's just not evenly distributed yet. And that's really, really obvious in UK public services. So um, there's this thought in the health services that maybe small doctors' practices are not very good, they're a bit backwards, they don't know about new things. And, and this has sometimes driven policy in the past. But now that we've got all this data, we can actually start to analyse what really does happen. So, you know, are, are the small practices backwards? Do, do, can we tell that? And it turns out, yes, because we've got all this data about prescriptions and about the size of surgeries and all their different characteristics, we can actually now start to challenge those thoughts with data. And uh, doing this analysis here, you can see uh, along the x-axis of this is how long a new drug has been available, in this case something called Bigerin, which is used for diabe diabetes. And up the y-axis is what proportion of the practices in the country have actually used that drug. And you run the analysis. The red line shows practices with one doctor in them. The blue line shows practices with more than one. And yeah, actually that assumption that people have about small practices is, is somewhat true. So the single doctor practices are slower to innovate than the, than the multiple doctor practices. Okay, so we've found out something useful. We've managed to quantify an assumption. But then we can also go a bit further and we can start to say, well, what does it look like uh, when people's neighbours take up a new drug? And actually, when we do that analysis, we find that that's actually really important and systematic influence as well, is what, what the social effects are. And we can only do this now because we have big, rich data available and because people like you in this room are able to manipulate that data. You are able to apply your skills to do this because health policy people don't do this. This isn't, this isn't their approach. So it's very important to apply these skills to, to the data. And actually what, what we found in particular was that you can see the, the one versus many doctor practices on the left versus the neighbour effect on the right. Actually what, what doctors' neighbours do is much more important than the size of the practice in spreading good behaviour. So uh, we managed to learn something new about the spread of innovation in the health services, which ultimately means the spread of better outcomes for people, which is, is a fantastic thing to be able to do. We can also start to look at things like cost factors. So, so this is an example of some work we did with uh, Ben Goldacre and with Open Healthcare UK, looking at this uh, problem of prescribing variation, which is a, another big deal for, for cost in the NHS. And this is really interesting because uh, they're trying to save a lot of money in the health service at the moment. Uh, I don't know about you, but I would really like that money to be saved through things that have no effect on patients. So uh, there is an opportunity to do that uh, in prescribing patterns. So there are particular types of drugs where there's a proprietary form and a generic form. The proprietary one is way more expensive, 10 to 20 times more expensive, and has a very similar effect for most people as the generic. So on the whole, the, uh, the NHS would much rather doctors prescribe the generic form and only the expensive form if it's needed. Makes sense. Um, however, of course, doctors can't be banned from prescribing the expensive form, because for some people, it's better. And the drug companies would really like doctors to always prescribe the form that they make profit from, which is the proprietary. So there are lots of different forces pushing <laughs> behaviors in different directions. And we did this analysis of whether there is uh, surprising variation in prescription of these drugs, again, using that very big raw data set that the NHS releases to try and see if there really is a problem with unexpected variation of prescribing. And it turns out, yes, there is. Um, so this map shows the, uh, the administrative areas of the NHS, which are called uh, CCGs. And the color of the areas shows uh, in that region, is there a high or a low proportion of these proprietary drugs being prescribed? So we would expect, if all doctors were completely consistent, this map to be completely flat coloured. As you can see, actually, uh, there's a huge variation. So in some areas, more than a third of the drugs are this expensive form. In some areas, it's only 10%. So there's a huge variation, and that variation is worth £200 million a year to the NHS. 
So by, again, doing, uh, doing an analysis on the data that's there, there's an opportunity to, to really help pinpoint some patterns of behaviors. And by the way, we don't necessarily know why these variations happen. We have to work with, with doctors and with the people involved to do this. But we can start to at least help to use data to drive, drive these changes and to help people to understand it. Finally, um, we can start to make the workings of the system more transparent. So uh, we looked at these things called uh, QOFs, Quality Outcome Frameworks. <coughs> Um, these are essentially the, the KPIs for GPs. So they're, they're the ways that uh, GPs are measured. Um, they're supposed to hit these, and if they hit all the costs, they get paid a bit more um, points and prizes. So it's not that surprising that most GPs uh, hit most costs. That's, that's good, because that means most doctors are doing the right thing. Um, however, when you start to look at the ones that are missing, you find some interesting patterns again. So most people are good, the bar on the left, some people are actually quite poor overall. The bar on the right, happily, it's a very small proportion. And the bar in the middle has this kind of other cluster, which is doctors who are just seem to be bad on palliative care and nothing else. So again, there's, there's suddenly a, a pattern of behaviors we can find by trying to analyze the data. And again, we don't necessarily know why that is, but this is again something that Nestor is starting to look into as a result of this analysis. So, Click is broken. There we are. Um, so I'm just about to run out of time, so I'm going to wrap up here. Um, I hope I've given you some ideas of why health data is interesting, where you can get it from, and really encourage you to take a look at it. Um, I know the NHS is very keen on having people innovate at the moment, and, and they actually do want people to start working with them on, on these new technologies. And to give you a couple of things to follow up on, um, the top link is uh, some code for an open health data platform. You can fork it, do what you like with it. It's all open source, so have a play. Second link is the Health and Social Care Information Center, which is where all this data lives. So you can get data from there and actually have a look at it and, and try and make sense of it yourself. And finally, the link to Nesta, who actually pay for uh, quite a lot of that work and have been doing a lot of investigation into innovation in health. <coughs> Um, their report's going to be issued really soon, and it's, it should be worth a look. Um, so that's me. Uh, I hope uh, I've shown you that particularly working on health would be doing something that matters. And uh, I hope you enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank you very much. Thank you.